Hello, and welcome to the third and final of the 2019 winter webinars from the Sir James Dunn Animal Welfare Centre at the Atlantic Veterinary College in Prince Edward Island, Canada. I'm Dr. Alice Crook, coordinator of the centre, and I'm pleased that we have registrants from far and wide again this year, Canada and the US, several European countries, Australia, New Zealand, the Caribbean. I want to extend a particular welcome to all those returning webinar attendees from previous years, and also to ABC alumni in the audience, as well as to many vet students and AHT students, many trainers and behavioral consultants. Welcome to you all. Before I introduce our presenter, I'm going to go over a few things so you will know how to participate in today's event. First, it is a good idea to close all unnecessary programs or apps running on your computer. We've taken a screenshot to show you what you will see on your own computer desktop. Taking up most of the screen is the GoToWebinar viewer through which you will see the presentation. In the upper right is the GoToWebinar control panel where you can choose the audio mode and where you can ask questions. By default, you're listening in using your computer speaker system. If you would prefer to listen over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Note that your control panel will collapse automatically when you're not using it. To keep it open, you can click the view menu at the top and uncheck auto hide control panel. Here's a closer look at the control panel and how you can participate. You have all joined the webinar in listen only mode, which means you are muted. However, we welcome your questions or comments, which you can submit at any time by typing them into the question pane in the control panel. You can send them at any point, we'll collect them and Dr. Overall will address them at the end of today's presentation. Note also that today's presentation is being recorded and will be sent to you in a follow-up email from GoToWebinar within a few days. And I just want to note that the recordings will be available for viewing until April the 30th. So you can view them or the previous ones uh, as often as you want up until April 30th via these links. All paid registrants will receive a CE certificate within about a week of the last webinar. So that they'll start coming through within a week or so. So today, once again, I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome um, Karen Overall to webinar. She has given hundreds of national and international presentations and short courses and is the author of over a hundred scholarly publications, dozens of textbook chapters, and the text Clinical Behavioral Medicine for Small Animals and Manual of Clinical Behavioral Medicine for Dogs and Cats, and of the DVD Humane Behavioral Care for Dogs, Problem Prevention and Treatment. She is the editor-in-chief for, for the Journal of Veterinary Behavior, Clinical Applications and Research, Dr. Overall is a senior research scientist in the biology department at the University of Pennsylvania. She studies the effects of anxiety and reactivity on performance and mental health in dogs. And she is also adjunct professor here at the Atlantic Veterinary College. Welcome, Karen. Thank you, Alice. So I'm gonna turn it over to your screen. Okay. I keep thinking there's a magic way to make this happen all at once, but it's always stepwise. Okay. okay. Uh, I think it's happening. I think it's happening. It's saying connected go to webinar. Yeah, I see that, but that's not what I want to do. I said, please share my screen, show screen. Let's see. Let's see if that'll do it. That looks good. Yeah, so far, so good. <laughs> oh, there, you go. there we go. Um, and that's Hamilton, the puppy who was, oops, I've got to go back to the beginning, who was um, just eight months old last week and there he is doing one of he he picks up on these tricks very quickly that he learns in his training classes like he can get in little boxes and he really has all four feet and his tail on the stool somehow and it's uh he's a very clever little puppy which comes with its own host of interesting issues having smart dogs is not for the unadventurous Okay, so can you see all of this, Alice? Are we now fine? Yep, we're seeing the okay. title slide. Yeah, perfect. 
So we're going to follow up on what we did last year um, where we talked about some of the papers that had come out in the previous year or two that are really important and that people in practice or trainers or people who do some counseling or um, veterinarians who might do different things than academia may not get to see, even though some of them are in the open access literature in the public domain, simply because um, they won't have the time or they won't know about them, or more often than not, you have to be a member of these organizations to be able to access some of these papers or, or be at a university or pay a small fortune. So there's a huge amount now of basic science research um, and veterinary research, oddly enough, being done by people who um, either do animal welfare or animal welfare and ethics or um, applied animal behavior or behavior or cognition and they might be interested in dogs um, or genetics and they're interested in cats, whatever. But there's this huge amount now of basic science literature pertaining to behavior in all sorts of companion animals, but more so with dogs and cats, that is being done largely by people who are not veterinarians or not uh, veterinarians and PhDs, who are PhDs who are doing an excellent job. And because it's not showing up in the traditional medical journals and it's not showing up in, in accessible areas where other people might know about it, and because these aren't veterinarians, so they might not be names that people would recognize, um, it's being missed. So we're going to follow up the same way we did last year, talk about some findings that'll change the way you think and practice or maybe offer your opinion to others. Um, and this year, Alice asked me to keep it to 10. So, um, I could actually take a breath occasionally and wasn't talking so quickly, but also so we could have more questions because some of these papers are fairly complex. Some of them are dirt simple. Um, and some of them I chose just because they have an answer to a question that maybe yes or no, and, but it's an answer we needed to know. Uh, one of the cap papers we're gonna talk about is like that. And it's an important paper because it answered something that people for the, the welfare of cats, especially in shelters, needed to know the answer to. And as far as I'm concerned, it's done now. So we'll, we'll talk about those. As I did last year, um, what, we, what I'll do is um, use the original papers. I'm just gonna let the people speak for themselves. I'll editorialize, but um, I'm using, I'm just gonna show you their words and I'll tell you what they mean and what's important. So we have 10 papers split over um, seven topics. Uh, and the first topic is something that comes up pretty much everywhere in the world. And this has been ongoing for the past 20 years and it's breed specific legislation or BSL. <sighs> Whenever we aren't the kind of people we would hope we should be, we somehow think that can be fixed with legislation. And I've, I've never understood that. So when we don't do the types of care that we should be doing for dogs or the breeding choices we should be making with the dogs we might breed or the management choices we should make for the dogs in our care, um, somebody wants to legislate something. So there have been a number of studies over the years that have suggested various degrees of effect of breeds specific legislation. And make no mistake, this is not a biological discussion. This largely is a political issue because it's something that people can scream about. And I'm sure everybody in Canada remembers the pit bull situation in Montreal a couple of years ago, and there have been a couple since. So, you know, um, despite the veterinary association and everybody saying, oh, you can't pass these laws, of course they're going to pass laws, and then they tend to rescind them. But it doesn't matter. Some dogs and their humans have been, um, been broken apart by these. Okay, so the question that this paper is going to ask um, is in a system for which there are excellent dog and injury data, which is atypical, and that's important. Most of the time we have poor 
epidemiological data on the human injury. And we have even worse epidemiological data on the dogs, who's involved, numbers, what has happened. So this is a paper out of Denmark, which means that the data in both cases are excellent because of the types of data banks they keep. So in a system where there are excellent dog and injury data, is there evidence that breed-specific legislation prevents dog bites? This is an open access paper, plus one is an open access journal. It's uh, meaning anybody can access it. You could type in plus one online. The journal will come up. You can surf it. You can type in keywords. You can download papers. Um, and the reason that you have access to that is because people pay to have their papers published. So it's thousands of dollars to publish a paper. Yeah, they're peer reviewed, but um, you, you have to pay thousands of dollars, but that makes it accessible to everybody. So anybody could read this paper. It's not light reading um, because these guys actually um, are all statisticians, I think. Uh, so they talked about the effect of BSL um, in one region of Denmark, and they did something called a time series intervention study, which is a very sophisticated technique that actually looks at and models um, and weights um, patterns of change over time in a way that allows you to compare the rates of change and how much you believe those rates of change statistically. So they start out in their abstract saying something that's very important. And one of the things I like about this paper is they said it and almost no one does. Um, whilst many studies have shown a lack of effect with such legislation, the commonly used methodology is known to be flawed. By and large, the statistics in these studies are awful. Um, and the designs are even worse. And as I said, they usually have incomplete data. Therefore, the aim of this study is to um, investigate the effect of the Danish breed-specific legislation on the number of dog bites using more credible methods. They used a time series intervention method on this data set from this one university hospital, which is the catchment basin for the region with the legislation. The, the legislation was uh, nationwide, but the um, way the injury data and the dog data are kept are by, by regional area. Um, the results indicate that banning certain breeds has a highly limited effect on the overall level of dog bite injuries, and that an enforcement of the use of muzzles and a leash in public places for these breeds also has a limited effect. Now, that's a surprise finding because you go to many places all over Europe, and you see a bully breed or any breed that's on whatever the local list is because local option tends to take effect. So if you go to Bavaria in Germany, you'll see a different dog list than you will in other parts of Germany. Uh, but you'll see people with the muzzles hanging around the dog's necks. And when they see another person or another dog, they'll often slip the muzzle up over the nose if they didn't already have it on. But it's the, it's just attached to the dog's collar. And they'll always put them on to take them into the metro. Now, that's an advantage in one case because it allows dogs to travel with their humans from place to place using public transport, which is not something that we do in the U.S. And it's a shame because the extent to which dogs can go with you affects the types of relationships you have and also the types of injuries and also the types of ways you weight the value of the dog. It's a very complex issue. I would love to start seeing studies on it. No one's looking at it, but I will tell you that how you keep dogs, the culture of how you keep dogs, affects every other thing, including the behavior problems you have. Okay, um, so let me keep going. Th these are the types of data that they looked at. So they looked at the number of dog bite injuries, and this is all places. This is private spaces like your own home or your backyard, public spaces, um, walking down the street, being at a school, being in a public park, uh, being in an urban center. And when they looked at the number of dog bites, I want you to realize that um, <clears throat> this is three times the number of dog bites in private spaces or three times the number in public spaces, because this is going to matter in a minute. Um, when they looked at after the legislation, obviously all the numbers dropped. This is still three times. Um, and when they looked at the odds ratios, because these are 
this is calculated by the rate. And if you're interested, the cool thing about PLOS One is they always put all this additional information about how they did the stats and what the stats were and what the data looked like in additional supplemental material links. You can click on this link and all of that comes up. So if you want to learn how they did this, that you can you can find that out. So what they did was they looked at the confidence intervals um, of the, the rates. So when they look at the confidence interval before, um, and then they look at the confidence interval after, the after confidence interval is contained in the before confidence interval. And what that tells you is this is likely not statistically significant. In other words, nothing much has changed. You're getting the same variability in the data. If you move over to look at public spaces, so the conference confidence interval before, <clears throat> again, contains the confidence largely contains, this is a little bit to the left, the confidence interval after, again, unlikely to be statistically significantly different. Look at the private spaces. Here's the confidence interval before. Whoa, that's actually a difference. They are not contained in each other, and in fact, they are a little different. Okay, so one of the things they say is, we found no statistically significant evidence accounting for the secular trends in data. More specifically, um, the out-of-sample prediction models of the time series actually don't differ significantly from observed variables in the post period for any of them. And they realized that um, when you look at the table I just showed you, where they, they consider the before-after analysis, they said that the bands significantly reduced um, the number of dog bites by about 15% across the board, but this effect really is driven by the private space effect. And that's an effect that this law had no power over. In other words, no one comes into your bedroom and tells you not how to play, don't play with your dog that way. So, this is something that comes up in every dog bite study, but no one's peeled it off this way. And unfortunately, they don't discuss it in depth because it's not what they were thinking about. But what this says is that when you pass legislation of any kind, it acts to some extent as an education campaign. So people get to thinking about these things. Well, in that case, we'd be better off with targeted education campaigns because here you are able to peel it off where it makes an effect within people's households. And in fact, when you look at their estimates for these time series plots, this is the private um, and this is the absolute estimate effect. And these zigzaggy lines that are interrupted, these are where they're uncertainty is okay so this is their 95 percent confidence interval and how uncertain they are so if you look at this in private these did drop okay if you look at this absolute estimates there was a, a drop it's a slight drop but it is significant um in public there it is the legislation made no difference in fact it may have caused an increase it's just not statistically significant so there you are Breed-specific legislation is never going to make us better people, never going to make us meet dogs' needs, never going to teach us how to teach children and young adults how to behave with their dogs, never going to teach us to stop starving and beating dogs. Um, we know how people get bitten and in what context they get bitten. We have it within our purview to truly drop that to an exceedingly low level so that we could only have the accidents. And, you know, I showed you the picture of our new puppy and damned if he isn't the second black Australian shepherd puppy I've had that didn't rip open my left hand simply with a puppy tooth as we were playing with a toy. You know, um, there it is. How would that be scored by a naive hospital who didn't understand anything about, about bites and preventive care? And this is why Tini de Coyster had started the Blue Dog Project. And if you, you're not familiar with the Blue Dog Project, uh, it's available online. There are online videos. It's been hugely successful. The World Small Animal Veterinary Association has recognized Tini's 25 years of work on this project to minimize dog bites in children. There is a lot of information there. And the thing I like about this program is it's culture-free, it's sex-free, it's language-free.
free. The videos don't use language, they use scenarios. Um, the kids get to participate. It's good for very, very young children. It's good for their parents. There's a parental book. Um, and the point that drives most of this is that dogs have a right to be dogs. So part of what we have to do is realize they are dogs. They don't have opposable thumbs. They have teeth. And you can have accidents as the one that Hamilton, when he was a very young boy, um, caused to my left hand. So there you are. OK, what is going to what does gonadectomy really affect? As everybody knows, there are huge debates about whether or not we should rip out ovaries and cut off testicles now, and whether it's gonna increase the incidence of cancer, and we talked about that last year, and whether it's gonna make you into the dog from hell or a saint, or whether it's going to cause you to be stunted or a giant or all sorts of things, or maybe if you're a cat, you'll stop peeing or you'll start peeing or, yeah. There's a scenario for everything. So this is the cat paper I told you was actually so important, and it's a simple yes or no question. And this paper, and I had obviously downloaded this before we stuck the banner on it, but this paper won one of the two um, young scientist awards last year for the journal. We give two a year, um, chosen by the editorial board. Um, people who are part of the paper have to recuse themselves. And I mentioned that because um, Crystal's on the editorial board. Um, but this was chosen by the editorial board and outside researchers. It's one of the two papers that by an early career scientist was one of the best papers most likely to make an effect. So it's an important paper because they had published earlier um, a study that sh that looked at prepubertal gonadectomy of shelter cats at eight to 12 weeks and shown that there were no problems with doing that surgery at that age. Um, the question becomes, years later, do these animals who were early neutered have behavioral problems? Do they have problems with the most common thing that cats have problems with not using their litter box? And they looked at 162 cats, 110 prepubital, 52 traditional age godanectomy, meaning six to eight months, that were part of the original study. They were able to follow these cats. And they looked at the occurrence of undesirable behaviors as reported by odors in these cats. And they combined the groups together for this. Um, and because they found no statistical difference between the groups. So I'm going to cut to the chase and just tell you why this is important. And then we'll talk about this table. This is important because shelters have been worried that if they early neuter these kittens, they might have behavioral problems later on. One of the things people had worried about, although the early data um, published in the States had suggested it wouldn't happen, but will male cats be blocked more frequently because their urethra isn't sufficiently large? If they, they get grit in their bladder, will they block more, um, more frequently? No, the answer is no. And when you look at the behavioral concerns, the answer is no. There was no statistically significant difference between either group for any of these concerns or these concerns lumped. However, what they were able to do was tell you the percentage of the occurrence. Now, they lumped them because there was no statistical difference. But if what they then did, which is clever here, is they looked at the proportion of undesirable behaviors versus potentially undesirable behaviors. And this is from the client's viewpoint. In other words, what percentage of the clients would think these were awful behaviors? And this shows how not knowing what will actually happen in a population can affect your worldview of who you might or might not adopt out or might or might not take into your household. So destructive behavior occurred more frequently than anything else, and it occurred about 22% of the cats. So it, it, you know, it occurred in um, 40 cats. And the interesting thing is that about half of the people thought this was a big, big, undesirable problem. Stealing food, stealing food, it's a cat. Live with some dogs to know what stealing food is. 12%, um, okay. 43% of the people think this is a big issue. Fearful behavior, 8.6%. 12, 13% think it's a problem. Non-play aggression towards other animals, 6.2%. 
experience this. 35% of the people think this is a big problem. Take a look at some of these other things. Play-related behavior towards humans, 4.9%. 42% of the people think this is a mega issue. Non-play aggression, 36% think it's a mega issue. Look down here, disobedience. It's a cat, people. We asked them to be disobedient. We didn't select for anything else. We selected for them to be themselves by not selecting. 40%, 50% think house soiling is you know, a big deal, only 4.3% of these cats house soil. So if people think that house soiling, if that many people think that house soiling is a big deal, and trust me, it is, um, and they believed that shelter cats who had been early neutered would be more likely to house soil, they wouldn't take them home. So there is the answer to the question. No, it is a bit, we understand you think it's a big problem. It doesn't happen. So that's the value in this paper and probably why it got the award. Okay, Betty McGuire has been looking, she's out of Cornell and she's been looking at, uh, she's a non-veterinarian, um, been looking at gonadectomy on uh, shelter dogs. And she's got a whole series of papers of looking at scent marking in general, but lately she's been focusing on shelter dogs. And she's developed um, good relationships with the Cortland Community SPCA, which is actually a wonderful SPCA. When I had time to do these things, I used to go up and lecture to them regularly. They're, they're just very forward thinking. And the Tompkins County SPCA. Um, so they had two groups of dogs. Um, she wanted to make sure that it wasn't a sh anything wasn't a shelter effect, and she did two studies: a between dog study where she compared intact males and females, and gonadectomized in males and females with rate of urination because the frequency with which you urinate is a highly sexually dimorphic behavior. Uh, the likelihood of ground scratching that this is a probabilistic outcome of ground scratching, which has been thought to be somewhat dimorphic. I'm actually never been convinced that it is, um, but people have said that it is, and I don't think all ground scratching is the same. So I think there is a sexually dimorphic one, but probably not this one. Um, and likelihood of defecation, which really probably shouldn't be sexually dimorphic. And then she looked at a within dog study where she looked at the rate of urination um, before and after in neutered individuals. Okay, so what did she find? Consistent with the prediction that gonadectomy would decrease urine marking in male dogs and have no effect in urine marking in female dogs, I found that castrated males urinated at lower rates than intact males and that spayed females and intact females urinated at similar rates. Okay, that's good for a couple of reasons. If people are having a problem with their male dog urinating in lots of places, we can tell them that neutering that dog may decrease the uh, frequency of, of barking and that it did in controlled studies. The problem is the individuals in the within dog study, they're quite variable. Um, so if you looked at the dogs as a whole, yes, statistically there was a decrease for intact males. The second thing that that tells you is that is a sexually dimorphic behavior. So she actually confirms a hypothesis that everybody has taken as a given, and we really shouldn't do that. We've not had good data, there, there's been one study. This finding was robust and it characterized dogs from both shelters. Um, for the subset of dogs observed both before and after gonadectomy in the within dog study, overall rates of urination decreased after castration in males, but didn't change after spaying in females. And you would expect that. Females are going out there to wee, males are going out there to troll for God knows what. Finally, um, the dogs that they observed before and after uh, displayed behavior consistent with the dogs in each shelter. So th this isn't a shelter effect. This is this is a dog effect, which is a good thing. Now, she mentions the old studies. So I'm going to read these paragraphs because they're important. In contrast to previous observational studies, effects of castration on the rate of urination by males in both the between dog study and within dog study were found. Frank Beach did this amazing set of studies on urination and marking in beagles in the late 60s and early 70s. And I remember being an undergraduate and reading them all. 
Um, but he observed adult beagles in an outdoor pen, didn't think there was any difference between intact and uh, castrated males. Hart observed seven males in an outdoor pen um, and looked at different time periods after castration and found no significant difference in the number of urine marks before and after castration. Okay, these are artificial circumstances. These are outdoor pen males. And they have relationships and there's probably a learning effect. In the between dog study, no relationship was found between time since castration and either the rate of urination, which they measured on the first walk, or the average rate of urination on all walks in males castrated. That's important because the effect of taking away the hormones happens very, very quickly. Okay. Um, this shows that together with patterns, the decrease in urination shown by dogs within the dogs, the within dog study indicate that decreases in urination occur soon and the frequencies remain below pre-castration levels. Thus, it's unlikely that Hart's extensive observations um, after castration were too soon to see this effect. It was just, he he ignored the effect of pen dogs. And that's the problem, different social relationship. Um, and then she talks about the way her study differed. And she said, given the individual variation that characterizes behavioral response to castration in dogs, sample size may be important. And she had a very decent sample size here. So that's a good thing. She then said, consistent with previous research, individual differences were evident. Um, the source of variation, though, remains to be identified. For the most part, goat adectomy did not influence ground scratching behavior and defecation to scent marking behaviors that are not strongly dimorphic. So here she's actually tested the hypothesis that ground scratching in this context of eliminating, going out for a walk to eliminate, which is not what all ground scratching is, um, was not sexually dimorphic. So that's cool. And she's doing a really good job and she has a bunch more papers in press. and press. Um, it's about time somebody did this. And I need to say this. In veterinary medicine, we assume, especially veterinary behavioral medicine, we assume we know some stuff. And so when people go out and they start to do these in-depth studies, some of the authors of the early studies say, oh, I, you know, we already did that. We actually haven't done it all. And we haven't done most of it. And as a result, there's this new crop of young behavior and welfare people who are PhDs who are looking for projects that don't need funding. And they're going out there and they're taking all the low hanging fruit that veterinary researchers for years could have taken on quite easily in unfunded situations with residents and we've chosen not to do it. So shame on us, in a sense. Um, but I'm delighted to have this literature. And I think this is where we can um, build in a relationship between basic scientists and veterinarians. My concern about the welfare issues is that if we don't start getting veterinarians who do research, who are interested in behavioral medicine, also interested in welfare. We don't have this from inside. And I think that one of the problems that we've had is that we may have welfare rules and everybody thinks of welfare as large animal, but we don't have a commitment starting from the ground up that integrates welfare into veterinary medicine on a day one basis. And allows us to incorporate that, that if we had people nested in veterinary medicine and veterinary behavior who are also interested and trained in welfare, that we could get. Instead, we've got these two groups where people basically say, well, those people are PhDs. And it's a bias, but we need to be aware of it. Okay, this is another open access journal, Frontiers in Veterinary Science. You can get this online. Um, people pay to publish in this. Again, it's peer reviewed. Um, this is aggression towards familiar people, strangers, and conspecifics in gonadectomized and intact dogs. And this is a group study from um, a number of, of different universities where they um, used the Canine Behavioral Assessment Research Questionnaire, CBARC, which actually has only it has not truly been validated. It was validated against, oddly enough, my clinical questionnaires and Sharon Kroll Davis's clinical questionnaires, but those were questionnaires that are very, very similar and that are designed to elucidate behavioral concerns with a diagnosis. 
they may not be applicable to a population of pet dogs as a whole. And I was talking to a statistician recently who said they, they lack face, this test still lacks face validity. No one's ever seen if those are valid ways to approach assessment of dogs in general. They're tremendously valid, and parts of the these questionnaires have been validated by me and others for um, clinical diagnoses, but that's not the same as evaluating dogs all over the place. But anyway, this is a standardized questionnaire, and standardization is the first part towards validation. But um, they used this questionnaire. They had a lot of dogs because of the way they did this study. Um, questionnaires generate large numbers. Um, and they compared data for intact dogs and gonadectomized dogs, and they broke them down at six months or less, seven to 12 months at age of gonadectomy, 11 to 18 months, and greater than 18 months. Okay. So I'll show you the data. So here's the odds ratio and the associated p-values from logistic regression models. Um, and they looked at aggression towards familiar people, aggression towards strangers, and aggression towards other dogs. Is the dog gonadectomized? And the age at gonadectomy. And then they looked at the, the odds ratio. And um, not much came out of this except for one thing. Um, dogs seven plus months of age. If you look at this, the odds ratio was 1.26. Uh, that means that for every one of the referent, so every one intact male who is aggressive, aggressive towards strangers, you will get one and a quarter dogs neutered at that time who would be aggressive to strangers. So the easiest way to think about it would be for every four gonadectomized dogs who would be aggressive to strangers, you would get five dogs who had been neutered at this time period. So that's what an odds ratio tells you. They, they tell you a relative risk. Um, and that was the big finding here, which is not what they predicted. And it's not what most people would predict because somewhere out there, somebody got hold of the idea that we should neuter dogs to prevent aggression. Um, I don't know who started to say that, but um, I actually went back and looked at my first publications and my earliest textbook. And I discuss the literature on reactivity in hormones, which is well established in rodents, and outright say <laughs> that um, this isn't the same as aggression. It will facilitate aggression um, and can help contribute to how awful it will be. But somehow out there, and I've heard it too, that you know, neuter dogs and they won't be aggressive. I'm not sure where that came from. Most people now who work their dogs uh, in sports or in professional work and neuter them, neuter male dogs because of focus issues, because as they go through sexual and social maturity, they get more and more distracted. Um, but it's it's a myth that's out there. So the one thing these data did was give a lie to that myth, that you're not going to affect aggression towards familiar people. You're not going to affect aggression towards other dogs. Boy, is that ever not going to affect it. There is a learning component here. You can see this as dogs get older with other dogs. You would expect them um, to possibly react. And here the problem is they may have been neutered because of the other dog effect, which they discuss in the text. So, you know, this is a group where you will get more sparring with each other. It may be pathological, it may not be, but people will neuter because of that. And in a study like this, you can't control for that. You would need a prospective study. So they, they make some really interesting comments that I think are important because they were very conservative. It's difficult to explain why our analysis demonstrated a significant increase in aggression towards strangers and dogs go net optimized between seven and twelve months of age. It's possible that this is a twelve that this is a type one error or a false positive finding. It's a statistical error because of the model they used. Boy, I don't think so. I think their second explanation is the right one. Experience of gonadectomy at this age creates a longstanding fear of responses to strangers. Boy, I think it's this. Your brain is still developing. Um, and I don't think it's just at this age, but I think this is a very susceptible age. And I'll tell you, I have had now four dogs as patients over the past six months who have come home 
from their neutering appointment terrified and very aggressive towards anybody in a veterinary hospital and many strangers. And the day before, they were not like that. So we have to realize that veterinary places are scary. We wouldn't treat kids who are eight years old the way we treat dogs who are the equivalent age. Um, and the noise, the lights, we need to use medication before they come in. We need to, to change the whole physical environment. We need to use pain and anxiety medication while they're there and after, and they need to go home as quickly as they can. Um, and there are lots of ways to deal with this that are outside the scope of the seminar. But I have a lecture just on that because um, we don't take advantage of things like recording clients' voices and playing them on an iPad, and, and we need to do some of this. But what they suggest is that these data do not suggest that intact dogs exhibit aggression any more frequently than gonadectomies. And they don't support the view that gonadectomy will reduce dogs' aggressive behavior. So um, we have made a bunch of assumptions here that aren't true, like aggression can be predicted by testosterone levels. But that's not true in any study that's being looked at. Testosterone affects the rate at which you react, the the degree to which you'll stay reactive, your um, recovery rate, and the types of behaviors you use. But it doesn't affect the, your willingness under normal situations to start a fight with somebody. And that's the mistake that is made here. So they talk about the literature and the multiple factors that may influence aggressive behavior, uh, regardless of the dog's reproductive status. And this is a great paragraph. If anybody reads nothing else, this is an excellent paragraph. And they go through the things that are risks and they talk about papers. For being a first time owner, yeah, I bet. People don't know what they're doing. This is why the Swiss require before you get a dog, before you can own a dog, you have to take an ownership class and you have to basically be licensed to have a dog. Less obedience training, okay? We know that's a correlation, it's not a cause. Um, is that because the people don't read the signaling well or is that because they don't learn better behaviors? Uh, dogs for gifts, is it because it's you don't have the same investment in the dog that you don't tolerate certain behaviors or you don't work to change them? These are all correlates. None of these are causes. But these are the hypotheses that should be tested in the future. Pet stores, is that epigenetics? Is it genetics? Is it nutrition? Is it exposure? Don't forget these dogs come from a very different genetic pool than non-pet store dogs. They are probably poorly nourished, at least if they come out of the state of Pennsylvania, they are. They're exposed to pretty awful things, which can lead to epigenetics. Um, teenagers, they're teenagers, you know, and teenagers interacting with teenagers of another species it's a toxic interaction. Teenagers are just rough and they're unpredictable. And now you're gonna put them with a teenage dog, bad things are gonna happen very often. Uh, somebody noted skin diseases, it wasn't, that just came out of it, it was uh, I think one of Norma Guy's studies, but it, it, that's not to imply it's only skin diseases. Anything that causes pain, paritis, any illness condition, all will be affected with heightened aggression. And the literature is rich there and they didn't cite most of it. Owner attitude, physical punishment, punish the dog physically, you can get that dog to come back at you. There isn't a dog in my household that I couldn't get to bite me with very little effort if I wanted to. You need to think about that. And these are all pretty normal dogs with one exception. And that one's completely psychotic. Um, dogs kept outside. Dogs were outside. They don't get the relationship. They don't get the signals. They don't get the expectation. They don't get any of this stuff. So you don't have the same relationship. Interestingly enough, they had a little discussion where they cited a paper that I had written with Molly Love on dog bites in 2001 that's widely cited still. And they point out that we noted that intact dogs were more were overrepresented in dog bites, but, and I was happy that they had the caveat, we didn't see that as a function of being intact. We saw it as a function, if you looked at the covariates that were available of how you kept your dogs. In other words, dogs who caused catastrophic injury to children who were intact also lacked their vaccinations, also lacked dog licenses, also tend to be tied out. So that 
that cluster of things goes back to owner attitudes and how well you you meet the dog's needs and care for the dog and minimize risk. So um, their point is actually they would like us to stop neutering dogs and come up with other methods of population control. I know that's the political part behind this. Um, that would work if we lived in Norway. Um, in the United States, we will have massive, massive unwanted dogs. We're just not responsible enough people. Okay, changing the way we practice medicine. This is a very simple paper, another cat paper. This is out of the welfare group at Guelph. Can you handle it? Validating negative responses to restraint in cats. So they created an ethogram for the cat exam procedure. And this is not as sophisticated as some cat ethograms. I wish they'd used some of the other ones out there, but still they uh, looked at tail lashing and they, they looked at something even more important. They looked at ear positioning cats. At least one ear pinna points towards the side or the back of the head and uh, changes ear position. And they taught people to restrain cats passively just by gently putting a hand on them. The classic way of full body cat restraint is you stretch the cat all the way out and you whack it down. And sure enough, if you look at ear position in cats, if you look at a, a composite ear score that they created for the four different time periods during the various times of restraint that they use, um, by the time you get to full body restraint, these cats' ears are back and they will bite you and they are hostile and they are distressed and passive restraint works tons better. So um, people, the thing that they don't mention that I want to mention, people were much happier with passive restraint. They were able to get through the exam more quickly. They just had to learn how to do it. Could be as simple as they did take these cats out, but you don't have to. This could be done in a cat carrier or with towels. It could be done in a cruise buddy bag. There are loads of ways to do passive restraint, but they res they're respectful of the cat's needs. The thing I want to point out here is that when you do these full body restraint, you are more at risk. These cats are now hostile and they will bite you and they will scratch you. So uh, just from the liability standpoint and public health standpoint, we want to do passive things. So quick finding, actually important. Um, we need to consider that some of our behavioral advice may be wrong, <laughs> and I think we need to test our assertions, and in a pilot study from Chiara Mariti's group and Angelo Gazzano's group out of the University of Pisa, they looked at whether or not one of the things that we always tell people is wrong. And um, many, 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 many behavior people, and certainly this was the advice before I started doing this. I was, I remember being shocked when I heard this advice, but the advice is not to pet dogs when you're leaving them. Um, in fact, the advice is to ignore the dog. And, you know, some of us tempered that to, well, you, if the dog is jumping up and down and shrieking, you can calm the dog, but you don't want to droop yourself over the dog and, oh, my poor baby, I feel so guilty about leaving and, you know, possibly your anxiety contributing to the dog's anxiety. So somewhere between those two extremes, we need to find out what the truth is. So they did this brief separation study, which is pretty cool. So the dogs came in and there were video cameras and there was an experimenter and the human with the dog. And then the dog was handed over to the experimenter and the human left and stood, went behind this gate and stood behind this platform. And they saw what the dog did. And in one case, the dog was completely ignored. And in another case, the other treatment, they gently petted the dog before they left. Okay, so what was the difference? Um, in fact, if you pet the dog before you leave, their heart rate decreases and they are calmer, which is exactly what most people, if they thought about it, would predict. Why would you suddenly ignore somebody? Why would you choose not to give them information? Gentle, calm petting, talking to them, looking at them, being calm should help. And in fact, it did. Now, small study, pilot study needs to be expanded. But boy, that, you know, that whole thing about ignore the dog on your way out, 
it's like we should muzzle everything and dogs should obey. This is all out of dominance. I hate to tell you this, the relics of dominance theory on how we handle our pets continue to be damaging, even from people who say, I don't believe in that. They don't even realize that chaining a dog or muzzling dogs to examine them is a form of that. Okay, let's talk about measuring distress, cognitive and cognitive function and performance in dogs. And we're gonna talk about two papers. One is gonna be a little more complicated than the other. Let me sniff, nose work induces positive judgment bias in dogs. This is an Alexander Horowitz and Charlotte Duranton paper. And um, cognitive bias tests usually have um, a reward that is in one corner of the arena and a non-reward signal that's in the other. So usually these are uh, five choices. So there would be um, five places for buckets and one would always be rewarded and the one at the other extreme would always be not rewarded. You can switch them. Uh, normal animals of every species that's being looked at, and God knows now, I think there are very few species who haven't been subjected to a cognitive bias test. You get one technique that's cheap to do, and God, there's a species out there, it'll be applied. Uh, you switch them within one or two trials. Um, normal animals will go over and check out the other bucket to see, did they switch which side? Okay. Um, distressed animals may have trouble doing that. Here it's a simplified version, rewarded, not rewarded, and something in the middle. And when you have these, whether it's the five array or the three array, the thing that people realize is that dogs and other species who are distressed or anxious, if it's not, the bucket is not in the same place, the reward is not in the same place, they have trouble moving across these. My dogs would just barrel down anything and knock over the buckets to see if there was anything in them because none of these dogs suffer from any of that stuff. But you know, if a dog is worried and they learned this was the reward and this is not the reward, they may not know what to do with something that's ambiguous. So the middle signal or the partial signals are considered ambiguous signals. So this was their study design. And they looked at dogs who had had nose work training and dogs who didn't. It's a nicely balanced design. Both of these women do lovely, um, very well designed studies. Uh, again, neither of them are veterinarians. And they looked at the latency to reach the ambiguous bowl in the test um, before and after behavioral treatment. So um, here are the nose work exercises and here are the heel work. So their control, you have to train the dog. So they just taught them to heal instead of to sniff things out. So the dogs who only did heel work exercises um, didn't have any difference in their latency for approaching the ambiguous bowl. Dogs who had nose work, became much bolder and approached the ambiguous bowl more quickly. Now that's an important finding and they don't discuss the neurobiology of it. But every cognitive condition that's been measured in humans has a decrement in olfactory ability and you may be able to detect the first signs of schizophrenia or Alzheimer's disease, um, for example, or any of the tauopathies through olfactory biopsies. We've shown some of this in dogs and published it. Um, and the nose may be a mirror of the brain. The olfactory epithelium is the only epithelium that you can reach and it's one cell away. The nerves are one cell away from um, the outside world and you can biopsy it. But it may also be that if you stimulate the nose, you may be helping the frontal cortex and those experiments have yet to be done. Okay, so that was cool. Um, so teach your dog's nose work. Um, use their brains. And, and part of this is, um, you know, the heel work exercise, they obey you. Um, nose work, they get to work on their own. So it's more than the olfaction. It's their developing way of thinking. I'm actually going to talk about a paper that I'm an author on and my husband's an author on. And it's my residence residency paper because this turned out to be an important paper and we weren't expecting that. 
Um, roles for referential focus in effective and, canine, effective and efficient canine signaling. Do pet and working dogs differ? So I've been working on a big project with working dogs and pet dogs for years, and this is a subset of the data from that. And what we did was we videotaped large numbers of dogs from both groups. These were largely detection dogs. There are some patrol dogs in the working dog group. These were all pet dogs as part of a cognitive study, and this was early in the study, so only half the dogs were included. Um, and we asked the dogs to do two things, two conditions, and three requests. We asked them to sit, then to lie down, which is the normal sequence. So sit down and then stay. And the humans just took a, a meter step back. And we, the two conditions were with the humans facing them, the front facing condition, and then the humans had to repeat it with their backs turned, the back facing condition. Well, the interesting thing, and this defined working dogs for pretty much everything in this study, they had very short latencies and very quick times to completion by and large um, for everything except here because they actually didn't manage to do the down and the stay, and most of them had trouble even with the sit. So we had a 95, 97.5 success rate for the front-facing condition, and God, 5.7% for staying for the working dogs, 81% for just sitting. Interestingly, when you did turning the back, they had very quick times and latencies compared to pet dogs, but they got it wrong almost all the time. <laughs> and so they were fast and wrong, and the pet dogs got it right. Now, that in itself would have been a paper. They're different. But it would be nice to know what they were doing. So Deb did this lovely ethogram. These were all the behaviors that she saw in these hundreds of videos. Okay, I think it was um, almost 200 videos. So these are all the behaviors she saw in these videos. And here are the definitions. And they're numbered, and that matters because um, we're going to graph them by number. So this is gazing upward towards the handler's face. And this is the working dogs. Okay, and we're not going to go through these, but look at the distribution of behaviors. And the first thing you should realize is this only goes to 23, and yet that table goes to 31. And the reason for that is working dogs left out huge suites of behaviors. They just dropped out of their vocabularies. So this is what the distribution of working dogs looks like. This is what the distribution of pet dogs looks like. They're not giving the same signals. The distributions are statistically significantly different. And the working dogs drop out all of these signals, which are about asking for information. Why? Because they've probably never been rewarded for it. Most of these working dogs are group working dogs. They're contractor dogs. Um, people see them the same way they see their government-issued vehicle, their government-issued uniform, their government-issued weapon, um, here's their government-issued dog, and we've missed the whole point of signaling. Look at how depauperate their signaling is compared to what pet dogs do. They do do some signals in great frequency, and many of these have to do with the trained behaviors they exhibit. So they're always watching the handler's hand. They're always trying to watch where they put that hand because that's how they're trained. But one of the things that Deb found when we realized that they dropped out all of these signals where they ask for more information, she says, lack of clarity in signaling and decreased comprehension of signals affects a dog's emotional state and his implications for welfare. The human's ability to observe and perceive body language as part of the reciprocal communication allows them to assess the dog's emotional state. Lack of awareness of subtle signaling indicating uncertainty, anxiety, or distress in the dog 
may result in inappropriate or ineffective human signaling and failure of the desired outcome. And that's what's happening here. These guys don't even know the dogs are talking to them. And pretty much if that happens over a long period of time, the dogs stop talking. Failed signals may perpetuate compromised emotional welfare and detract from the cooperative relationship, which is exactly what happened here. And in considering dyadic interactions between humans and canines, a goal of social synchrony in which the behavior between bonded partners interacting with each other can be coordinated, you'd have greater success in achieving the intended outcome. And this is an important finding for working dog people because they still don't get this. Successful dual signaling between humans and dogs should also reduce the risk of compromised emotional and cognitive states. And that's the point here. We want to read signaling well, and this is a really great example of using a very traditional ethological approach and a very traditional communication and signaling sender and receiver approach. Um, to find out, good God, we have basically taught these working dogs to not tell us what they need or want. And we shouldn't be doing that. Okay, we're gonna finish up with, is it behavioral or is it neurological? Which is hot, hot, hot right now. And I think we have to realize that they're using the same brain. So we should think about what that could tell us. And this is a very cool study. This is from 2015, but I'm showing it to you because it has come up in a listserv discussion multiple times recently. This is a retrospective multi-center evaluation of what they called fly-catching syndrome. I would have left out the syndrome because it's a badly defined syndrome. I would just have said fly-catching behavior. In 24 dogs, EC, EEG, bear, MRI, CSF findings, and response to anti-epileptic and antidepressant treatment. And the question is, when these dogs snap at flies, at things that aren't there, is this a seizure or is this a behavioral component? I can show you dozens of videos of dogs doing this where it's truly a form of OCD. The dog is as neurologically normal as you could hope from the growth standpoint. In other words, there are no epileptiform events. These dogs have seen neurologists. Um, you can talk to them. They may not wanna focus on you, but they're completely there. And all of it is behavioral. It may run in family lines. Um, you know, there are lots going on there. I can also show you a series of dogs who I sent to neurologists or who ended up at neurologists and they underwent some of these studies and they found something in the CSF or they found a brain anomaly or they found a weird set of bear signals or the EEG was off and I'm not gonna see those dogs because they have another diagnosis. So they did something very clever and I know you can't read this. I'm happy to send the article to whomever wants it and I have not forgotten those of you who want the cat strategy um, for treating diagrams for these, um, for the cats we talked about last week. I just haven't had time. I promise I will, all of the people who are still waiting for stuff, I haven't forgotten you, I will do it. But I'm happy to send anybody this paper if they would like to take a closer look at this table. So here are their dogs and they tell you, um, this is a mistake, it should say sex, gender is only for humans. Um, MRI, who had an MRI and a couple of these dogs missed it? Who had an EEG and a couple of the dogs missed their EEG? Um, what was the end diagnosis? Idiopathic epilepsy, idiopathic epilepsy, idiopathic OCD, OCD, OCD. Some of the dogs had both. Well, they could, couldn't they? Um, a couple of them had tumors. Um, treatment summary, phenobarbital versus fluoxetine. Who responded to what? Um, and the clever thing these people did, which made this paper something to hold on to, is they did all of this and then they broke the dogs randomly into two groups. And they chose one group to treat with phenobarb and another to treat with fluoxetine. And then if necessary, they reversed it. So they knew who responded to what. And sure enough, most of the epileptic dogs responded to phenobarb and most of the OCD dogs responded to fluoxetine, but some of the dogs diagnosed with seizures also responded to fluoxetine. And that's an important finding because it tells you that the effects of glutamate, which are involved in seizures and impulsivity, and fly biting is an extremely impulsive condition, depend on the region of the brain involved.
So you could have a very discrete region that would affect OCD or a much more diffuse region that might also include seizure activity, and you wouldn't expect only one drug to treat them. You might want to combine your medications. But this is a lovely way to think of this because people have always said to me, is it behavioral or is it neurological? And I've looked at them and I've said yes, because I think it's foolish to think these nonspecific signs. It's like, you know, a temperature elevation. Is it infectious? Is it not infectious? Yes. <laughs> you know? We have to approach this within the context of diagnostic criteria, which they did, and then the physiological functional assays, which they did. And I like this paper because when we've published our paper on OCD, these were dogs that had had neurological consults. Most of them had had MRIs. Most of them had had CSF taps. Most of them had tick panels. You know, we did something very similar to point out to people that no, these are not underlying medical conditions. Are there underlying medical conditions that can look like that? Yes, that wasn't the population of dogs we treated. Which brings me to my last paper that I'm just gonna gloss through because it's quick. Um, this is a review paper that's in the veterinary journal, um, a review of treatment options for dogs with behavioral manifestations of clinical anxiety as a comorbidity in dogs with idiopathic epilepsy. Okay, and um, this group led by Holger Volk, who is an absolutely excellent neurologist. Um, he's at the Royal Veterinary College in the UK. Um, here they've got a summary, I'm in the wrong place. Uh, they've got a summary of uh, anxiogenic and anxiolytic effects of uh, anti-epileptic drugs in human and veterinary medicine because some of these can make you um, more reactive, some can make you less reactive. I should note that the same thing is true for SSRIs and TCAs because serotonin at high levels can be very what's called activating, so it can make you more reactive. So it's not as clear cut as people would like to believe. <coughs> Excuse me. So they looked at the various medications and then they looked at evidence for veterinary medicine and the thing that's going to jump out is you is no evidence, no evidence, no evidence, no and not enough, no evidence. no. In other words, we haven't really, really looked at these. Now, I have to tell you that um, their conclusions are important, but for years, in human medicine, and there are a number of published studies which are now cited in this paper, um, where we realize that seizure activity is extremely distressing and anxiogenic itself. So for years, and this goes back, oh God, 20 years, more than 20 years, working with the neurologist, we added anti-anxiety medications to many of these patients, seizure medications based on what they've done in human medicine. And I still do it and I still recommend doing it and you decrease the frequency of the seizures quite often. So their conclusions are timely. They say anxiety disorders in people with epilepsy is garnering more attention and research, but the extent to which it affects dogs is under investigated. There are two lines in my 2013 textbook about this, about the experience I just recounted. Um, there are two more about what they found in humans. Um, with the absence of veterinary specific data, evidence-based medicine from people must be applied cautiously. In ideal circumstances, for individuals with this, we would look at the effects of the anxiety, come up with a behavior modification plan, describe, uh, prescribe anti-anxiety medication as needed. So I think that when you do this, now you're prescribing medications from multiple groups. And one of the things they say is what we've did and said, um, you're going to want to monitor the serum levels <clears throat> of your anti uh, epileptic drugs very, very carefully because they're very often affected by the same cytochrome P450 enzyme system. So you could really throw off the levels of the seizure drugs, but if you monitor them, you'll be able to adjust both medications and everybody can have a better quality of life, but there is overlap. And I think that overlap isn't just that you are sick and you get anxious. I think there's overlap at the neuromolecular level. I think that we're affecting other systems in the brain and we're just not thinking broadly enough. So where do I think the field is going in the future? 
based on where these studies are coming from. This says veterinarian offers low cost voodoo, client satisfaction rockets, skyrockets. This is what everybody wants, guys. Um, this came from cagelinervet.com. I thank my resident Ling Honickman for making my week by sending this to me because I have just about had it with voodoo things recently and it keeps coming up, but everybody wants voodoo. And I want to point out to you that the scarf and the makeup is in Pantone's color of the year, which is living coral. Okay, so... Um, I mentioned the NAVC course, even though it's full because it happens annually, so you may be able to catch it another time. You all know you can contact me, you can get the journal more cheaply if you're a member of one of these groups. And um, I'm over, Alice, I'm sorry. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Okay, great, Karen. So we do have a few questions, quite a few. Um, the first couple are about early neutering. So talking about pre in cats, there is a supposed increase in femoral head fractures with minor trauma in young adults. Do you know of any data on this? No. And that's the problem. Um, I think you'll be seeing some. The first people who measured long bone growth and uh, sitting in how the, the femurs sit in the socket for cats didn't find anything that was in, I want to say, 2000. Um, cats have slightly longer bone growth. Um, that's the whole thing everybody's worried about in dogs, um, are, is their joint laxity and hip dysplasia. The data, boy, if you, we aren't going to worry about the odds ratios we talked about here, we're sure not going to worry about the odds ratios and the couple of breed studies that have been done there. The thing we do know is you get longer, if you early neuter, you get longer long bone growth. That's known for every species. It's known for rodents. It's known for rats. We have excellent data in the castrati who were opera singers. They all had very long legs and very long arms. And it was written into operas because they were so distorted. Um, so the data on the fractures is incomplete. But, you know, given what we just said, be careful. People want to believe in catastrophes, which is where the voodoo thing comes in. So, I, you know, you've, you've really got to stop and hold on to yourself and say, boy, that's an interesting hypothesis, and I'd like to see the data. Um, here's another question. Do you, are you aware of any data on how neutering affects roaming behavior in dogs? That's an interesting question because the four things that Hart identified in his classic and never replicated study for neutering in dogs was um, interdog aggression. The four things he looked at were interdog aggression, roaming, urine marking, and mounting. And the urine marking, the interdog aggression were the big findings that neutering had a big effect on and the roaming slightly lesser. Um, and the mounting less of an effect than anybody believed except that it's a signaling behavior that's not necessarily sexually dimorphic. Um, the roaming is interesting because it may be an opportunity factor. In other words, not all male dogs who are intact will roam, but if they're in an area where they are, are estrus females, they are clearly more likely to roam than others. So the day it's the study's never been repeated. I will tell you that veterinarians who um, live in areas where dogs might get out and roam are always upset when somebody brings them a hit by car dog who is a young dog with his testicles because that dog was out roaming around and looking at things. And those are the data that we could get if veterinary medicine would ever get on board with a unified database. Because you could walk into any human hospital and ask them for those data and already know the answer to that question. You can't walk into a single veterinary hospital and know the answer to those, to those questions. You may be able to walk into a place like Penn, which has a very good database, or UC Davis, which has a very good database. And if they see enough of those, but really, we should have 
a combined database, and it's become one of my real bitches because I don't understand why we're, we want to make this a field for amateurs, and it's just ridiculous. Okay, that's the end of my rant. Okay. <laughs> um, one more question about the gonadectomized dogs. Um, that's that effect of the increased aggression to strangers. Was that specific to neutering at seven to twelve months, or was there yeah. something with the group? So it new earlier neutering, there was not that increased odd re odds ratio. Yeah, that was the weird thing. Um, you can still see my screen, right? Yep. Okay, let's just go back to that. That was the weird thing because oh damn it! Every time I move that bloody little arrow. It does something weird. Um, there we go. Okay, so if you look towards strangers, um, 13 to 18 months and greater than 18 months, no, no difference. Um, that's one. This is 1.14. That's not even statistically significantly different. There's the stats, okay? So this is the only one that was statistically significantly different. If you looked at these, there were no p-values that were significant. Even when we talked about aggression towards other dogs, and I said, this looks appealing, but you have to ask whether or not they neutered it because of the aggression. The only odds ratio here that was significant is this one. Huh. Okay. And, and that speaks to, if you think about it, you know, we always say dogs have <clears throat> excuse me, early fear periods, ah, be very careful. Um, seven to 12 months of age, you're beginning to approach social maturity, you're pruning neurons in your brain starting at about 10 months of age, you're certainly pruning them by 12 months of age, and I think that's what that is. I think that we have somehow mucked with what's going on neurodevelopmentally in the brain, and that's a time where if you have to do something, you really need to use a serious anti-anxiety and, and, you know, pain relief medications, and we're just probably not doing it. But yeah, so that's what those data look like. Okay. Okay. So the next one is looking at the nose work paper. So do they distinguish between positive judgment bias and that the nose work dogs are doing what they practiced and were reinforced for? I.e. In other, or yeah. is that an actual distinction? Uh, no, it's not a it's not a weird distinction. In other words, you're saying they could smell the food. That's the question here, right? That the nose work dogs had an advantage because they had been taught to sniff things out and they're using their nose the way it's intended and they could smell this. Um, I think the way this study was conducted that that was actually not an option because I think the reward came from the human here. I'd have to go back and check, but um, I think it's a true effect of the cognitive stimulation involved in nose work. These dogs got bolder and they had, if I'm not mistaken, didn't they have a latency? Yeah. And, and so what they looked at is um, not just accuracy. If it was just sniffing, it would affect accuracy. It shouldn't really affect the latency. And these dogs were just faster in identifying that. There's your only significant finding. I'd have to go back and double check, though, to make sure that that's true. Okay. Um, um, it's a good point because I have to tell you that <clears throat> the big um, cognitive model in dogs, um, it goes the other way, too. The big cognitive model in the dogs is the Toronto Beagle in a Box test, and it's a computer-driven set of cognitive tests in um, uh, this elaborate cage design that pretty much nobody else has ever been able to make work for them. Um, and there are um, food treats that are um, underneath and the dog has to knock over a cap to get the food treat. And in the original studies that were done, they were all cognitive studies on aging dogs. Um, there weren't also food treats under the other ones that the dogs couldn't get to. So they also had an olfactory cue. And it's a confounding factor for every single one of those studies. And it was rectified recently. But um, 
it can go the other way too, where you know um, you may think you have an impairment or an improvement, uh, depending on whether or not olfaction is being used. So be careful. It's a good question, and I'll go back and check the paper. Okay. So here's a question about the okay this is a yeah so what is the best way of of dealing with leaving a separation anxiety dog boy it's tough because um what i try to tell people and it's hard is i would really like them not left until they're well treated um i don't mean as in humanely treated i mean till we've got medication and behavior mod on board that really 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 helps um so if people do have to leave their dogs, they have to leave them in a way that's comfortable for that specific dog. Some dogs are comfortable in a crate. Some dogs panic in a crate. Some dogs are comfortable if they're kept in a room behind a gate or a door. Some dogs panic if they're kept in a room. Some dogs recognize the background noise of a radio is soothing. Some dogs recognize that as a signal that their humans are going to bolt out the door. So we tell people that they have to be left in whatever best meets their needs. And we need to find that out by collecting the data. And then we tell people to ask them to sit, to do some of the behavior mod and the deep breathing and the relaxation exercises, to tell them to not, you know, not get overly wrapped up in apologizing to them, not helping to feed into this, but do something that calms them. And of course, if they're my patients, they're already on medication and they will be getting medication starting the second the clients popped their eyes open that morning. Um, they'll be getting an additional as needed medication um, so they don't panic, so they don't become aroused, so they don't react. And then, you know, they're left with various things that they might need. If they have a blanket that's calming, if they like toys, if there's another dog, they should always be left with some food and some water. You'll know the dog is getting better the day they chew a food toy or they eat any of that food or they've drunk water to the point where when you come home, they don't just gobble down their entire water dish and whatever food you've left. If they're doing that, it's not that they're happy to see you. It's that they're too distressed. They were too distressed while you were gone to do anything. But it's tough. The best you can do um, if you have to leave them is medication, a comfortable environment, and try to calm them before you leave. Okay, that's good. Um, yeah, uh, and so what type of anti-anxiety meds would you recommend for a dog with idiopathic, idiopathic epilepsy? Um, we routinely use um, SSRIs because they're extraordinarily safe. Don't forget these dogs are often on phenobarbital, so we're worried a little bit about their liver. Um, phenobarbital and fluoxetine share uh, cytochrome P450 enzymes, so you're going to change the levels and you may need to adjust dosages, but we'll often use fluoxetine because it's so safe in these dogs. You can generally use relatively low dosages. It's stable over time. You're not going to get disruptions in the level it, um, that you might with some of the newer medications like escitalopram, which has to be given three times a day on a rigorous schedule. So we'll often use things like that. These dogs may be on benzos already. Um, we've got some of these dogs we've used alpha agonists on who might have profound periods of arousal um, just to keep them a little more steady. But usually we're reaching for the TCAs or the SSRIs. Here's one about off-leash. Are there any resources showing benefits of off-leash parks, not just fenced-in areas, in regards to dogs and people's quality of life? We currently have a public consultation in our area assessing the need for an off-leash walking area after some citizens started bear spraying dogs that were off-leash but were showing no aggression. Off-leash and public places, I guess. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. So not like, fenced areas, but being able to walk off leash. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are some studies on dog parks and off lead dog parks, and most of them have focused on the behavior of the dogs. There may be some in the literature that I don't know about for human quality of life. Um, 
dogs can be mixed because you've got to mix the dogs by style. And if there's a problematic dog, that can throw the whole thing in a dog park into havoc. It, it's an interesting question because um, my orthopedic surgeon who takes care of my foot, um, I have broken any number of bones over the past few years in one foot. And uh, it's spontaneous. There's nothing wrong with me underlying it, except that I have rheumatoid arthritis. And so I see this guy a lot, um, but was just yesterday talking on national public radio about the incidence of bone fractures they're seeing in people out walking their dogs in the winter. And uh, JMO's recommendation was, and you can tell he lives in Philadelphia when he said this, don't leash walk your dog in crappy weather. Take them to the dog park. Philadelphia has huge numbers of dog parks for off-lead runs. There are small dog parks. There are big dog parks. There are runs for dogs who don't get along with other dogs. And it's a well-policed system. And I'd say 90 plus percent of the time it works well. And I think you could argue that um, people's and dogs, mental health is probably greatly improved. These dogs, some of them are my patients, some of them aren't. Um, you don't want to send a dog to a dog park to get over its behavioral problem. All it will do is wreak havoc on other individuals. But the type of rigorous study you're talking about, I don't think exists. The interesting thing about this, though, is JMO's work strongly suggests that there's a human health benefit in that you won't be damaged as much. Um, and I think those types of things are important. There has been at least one paper on humans interacting with other humans in dog parks. So if you're worried about whether it'll help facilitate human-human interaction in people who may get not get enough of it, there may be an effect there. And there may be other papers that I know absolutely nothing about. Okay. Excuse me. Well, that seems to bring us to the end of the questions. So, um, hey. yeah. So, Karen, I, on behalf of everybody, including myself, I just want to thank you for the fascinating and important information you shared today and over the last couple of webinars. Um, so, thank you so much. And um, maybe we well, can entice you to do it next year. Yeah, <laughs> well, I am. Um... I love doing this. I think this is just a terrific way to reach out to people. And I like that it attracts a mixed group because this is how you get people to buy into the specialty fields of welfare and behavior. And I think it's really, really important. So Alice, I don't know any other place who sets up something like this. And the three part series is just great. And it's got CE credit, it's got race credit for vets, it's dirt cheap. It's, you know, there's a lot going for this. So I think, it, well, I think it was a brilliant idea. I don't know who, kind of, I, if this was your idea coming up with this, this was smart. This is, oh. this is clever. Well, thank you, Karen. Thank you for that plug for the, for everything too. And just to remind everybody that um, you can view the videos um, until April the 30th, as many times as you want. Um, and now there's people sending in comments, very nice comments, saying that they really appreciated them. So I'll pass good. those on to you, too. Well, I appreciated everybody's questions. It's a good group. And uh, and it's clearly sending me back to one of the papers. OK, so I guess I will end it for us all now. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Alice. Bye, everybody.